It's done. It works. The studio is built. It operates. It functions as it should. Would you like to see it? I'm sure you would. But first, I'm going to talk about LEDs for a while. I'm uh, a bit tired, but we have a deadline I gotta meet, so... Uh, Becky tells me I look uncomfortable, but that asks the question, am I actually uncomfortable, or is this just how I am? I think it's just how I am. You'll have to answer that question for yourself, I think. So, but I want to start with something a little bit fun, because my brain's a little blocky, uh, having trouble in the thought department this, this afternoon. I keep wanting to say this morning, but I think it's 2 p.m. But I'll pose a question to you. Is a studio really a studio if it lacks in the blinking light department? I submit to you, it is not. And while I have been gouging myself with power tools to make this studio go, um, it does lack in the blink and light department. Like, this board has been online for a long time. You really can't tell if the light's on, can you? So let's turn the lights off and take a look. Yeah, that just won't do it all. Only one VU lamp is lit. They're all supposed to be lit. Is it really a VU meter? If it doesn't have that orangey-orange glow? I... I don't think it is. And I bet these are incandescents, given the age of this. White LEDs weren't really a thing. So let's, um, let's pop these open, see what we got. Maybe we can see if we can do an LED conversion on these. Okay, here are the VU meters. Open it up. Let's pop open a, the working one first and see what we've got. <laughs> that there is an incandescent bulb. Given that it's incandescent, it chances are it could be AC or DC. I'm hoping it's DC because then uh, it'll look nicer if I do an LED on it. But the side of the meters say six volts, one watt. So I'm guessing that's what these are. Here, let's see if we can put it where you can see it. Okay, 5.3 volts. Not quite six. Yeah, that's definitely DC. And just so that I can remember, I'll mark the negative with a Sharpie. So this is the bulb. Looks like a fairly standard bulb labeled six volts, one watt. Uh, looks a little on the burned out side. So, tell you what, I'm gonna solder an LED right to this, because why not? And see if that works. So it's the next day, actually, and I've been doing a lot of debugging on uh, the studio, and I haven't been able to film a lot of it. But what we figured out is that this module right here, this X SB60, which is one of the uh, phone modules, is bad. It has a problem. I thought it was the op amps. I swapped out the op amps. Sounds better, but doesn't fix anything. So there's probably a bad cap or something in here. I don't have the parts to recap it, nor do I have the equipment to really recap surface mount caps like this really well. So um, we, we're ditching this and we're going with an N60. And I'm going to figure out a mix minus some other way for the phone. Um, a mix minus being everything mixed together, but the the channel that you're controlling so that the audio from the phone doesn't go into the phone so the caller doesn't hear themselves. Um, I'm going to get the mix minus for the other phone system out of the digital mixer because that has six auxes I'm not using and that would just be one extra run without a whole lot of punching or wiring or setup on the board. And then we'll see about fixing this later or perhaps even finding another module for it. So that's that. That's, uh, that's what you miss between, between scenes, I guess. With broken things out of the way, let's talk about other broken things. Uh, the VU 
the VU lights are out and they have these bulbs in them. Um, they're little six watt, uh, six volt, one watt incandescent bulbs. Uh, I've dialed up uh, my bench power supply. I brought it in from home and dialed it up for precisely that. And uh, I'm not seeing a whole heck of a lot. So this is good and blown. I'm gonna continue to use this though, the kind of fuse style thing, as a holder for LEDs. And I did some experimenting with uh, some LED configurations to figure out what I wanted. And I think to get the look that looks the best is I need to have one yellow and one white LED run in parallel. And so let's start with that. Now the yellow LED here, uh, I think is just fine. So, oh, hello, all right. So it kind of glows in all directions. Could stand to be a little bit diffused, I think. Uh, so I, um, but this white one here, I think it's designed for light bulbs or pencils. It's one of those crystal clear ones. It's all out the front. And so what you want is kind of a diffused LED. I don't have diffused LEDs and I tend not to buy diffused LEDs. What I tend to buy is whatever is cheap and it's usually the crystal clear ones. And when I need some diffused LEDs, I tend to make my own. So I'll take my white LED here and uh, I'll just uh, abrade the plastic casing here. And then you make sure you want to get the tip because that's where a lot of the light is going. And now, where before, you know what, let's turn out the glaring light here and see if I can make that a little bit clearer. So, a little bit of, if I plug it in correctly, now it's a little bit more noticeable. And just for completeness sake, I will, make a diffused yellow LED as well. All right, so that's good. We have diffused LEDs. So now I have to prep the LEDs for attachment to our LED holder. And you can't use LEDs without something to control the current. And in this case, I'm using some, uh, some resistors. And the first thing I'm gonna do is bend both leads in the same direction and in the same way. All right, so now I got these guys. And then I'm gonna take my resistor, attach it to the cathode and run the resistor behind the LED, like under the LED, like that. And then I'm gonna hit it with a sm the smallest amount of solder I can get away with. All right, that looks pretty good. So now I got something that looks like this. And now I'm gonna do the same thing to the other LED. Hey, a little bit more solder than I really wanted there, but whatever. Trim the leads. That went into space, presumably to return 
near the Maldives. And then we join the anodes and the cathodes of the two LEDs, connect those up. And there we go. So if I bring my lab power supply in, apply negative to one side and positive to the other, ta-da! Now all that remains is to attach it to the thing. And the thing being the, this light bulb here. And the light bulb being, well, round and not wanting to stay in one place, I have to tape it down. And unfortunately, this generally means the tape becomes a permanent fixture of the bulb. But, uh, well, it's not that big of a deal. And I give each side a nice, sizable solder pool. And I combine the sides, attach the LEDs to the bulb, and we're good to go. After we, after I let it cool down so I don't burn my hands, but we'll trim the leads again. What? What? <laughs> and now, since this is now a polarized thing, you're going to want to eye mark it so that I don't forget. There. One LED replacement. Now I just have to do this three more times. Okay, now that's all that's left is to install the bulb. So let's uh, flip open the meter bridge here. And I've got the, the slot exposed. So make sure I got it right here. Yep, that, that's good. And just clip it in place. And then socket it in. And screw the bulbs back into place, or screw the screws, the, the bulb holder back into place, I should say. You gotta be careful of these ribbon cables here. They're pretty fragile. I've broken a couple already and had to reconnect them. And flip the meter bridge back down. Take a look at it. Once you get the lights. Yeah. Yeah, that's more like it. Now this one's a little higher than the others. I could adjust that if I wanted to. Uh, but I don't think I care that much. Maybe I'll take care of it later. But now all the VU lights light up the way they're supposed to and they look good when paired with the, uh, the clock over there. But you'll notice that most of my on-off buttons don't really work. My on most of my on buttons seem to work. But none of the off ones do, because I imagine they've been on more. Oh, that one works. So I'm going to investigate that, I think. Well, that ended up being a lot easier than I thought. Um, here is the proper number of blinking lights. In fact, really, to be functional... Yeah, some of them are still a little sticky. That looks good. As it turns out, there's a dip switch in the strips, in the individual input units, that enables something called local off, which it waits for some sort of external signal to let you know that it's off. 
um, I had misinterpreted it, and I figured out that I had misinterpreted it by uh, testing out one of these strips and seeing what the voltage was when it was off, and I was like, it was zero. Well, zero doesn't make any sense. So I hit the documentation and saw that I had local off inverted. So I think the blink and light situation on the board here is done. I think it's good. All the VUs have lights. Uh, the timer and the clock work. All the off button works. We have a couple of fairly dim uh, on buttons. But honestly, as long as you know that if the bottom light is off, that's good enough for me for now. I can figure out everything else later. And now we have a guest table uh, for people who are on the radio, but not necessarily operating the board. We have guest one, guest two, and guest three. There's really not a whole lot to see from that side, so uh, come on over here. And you can see that there's not a whole lot to see from this side either. And here it is. Guest one, guest two, and guest three. They are on articulating microphone booms. Uh, in earlier revision of this studio, I actually repurposed Ikea lamps for this purpose, but the price on microphone booms has gotten so cheap, there's no point in making them myself when you, they can be bought uh, so inexpensively. So we're using actual microphone booms this time. And uh, as you can see, the uh, we're still waiting on some windscreens for, uh, for the microphones. And there's just not a lot on the table. There's, there's a place to plug in headphones with individual controls on headphone amplification so that everybody can have the loudness that they need. And the, other than that, there's nothing here. And that's by design because you want your guests focusing on what they're going to say, not uh, what they're saying it into. Now, you might notice that there's some, uh, that there is some warnings over here. Let's go take a closer look at that. So yeah, connection warning. To connect table, disconnect mics, power desk, connect Cat5, check for green LED light on table Cat5 box, and only then connect microphones. Incorrect connections can damage mics. Now the only connections between the board and the table are these two pieces, or, are these two pieces of Cat5, of Twisted Pair. Don't worry, this is temporary. Actually, this whole thing is temporary. We'll talk about that later. And so there's two jacks underneath the table right there, and they lead here up over and into this thing here. I hope you're getting a good look at that. So you can see the green LED there. So this cable carries not only the audio, but also the power for the headphone amplifier. And so one pair of Cat5 carries all three microphones. The other pair carries the left and right for the headphones and also the 18 volt AC power needed for the headphone amp. You don't want to mix those two up because what would happen if you mix those two up is that suddenly this microphone would start receiving 18 volts to things that should not be receiving 18 volts. That might be bad. I don't know what would happen, and frankly, I don't want to test on these microphones. <laughs> so, to simplify matters, 
I just included an LED on the microphone or on the microphone connections so that you could test. If you just you just unplug the microphones, do your wiring, and then once you see the green go LED, plug your microphones back in and the guests are online. Hey, cap it. Here, oh, pull one of these ICs out. Oh, I don't want that. That would have been bad. Yeah, see, I can just push it back. Well, that happened. And, uh, unfortunately, this is the output box. So the mixer doesn't mix too much without one of them. So I'm a little scared. A little scared that we might have just flummoxed the thing to death right on the eve of a victory. Now I do have another one of these, but I like the insurance a spare gives me. Now I get to attempt a surface mount repair with. And what exactly does that component do? It's one of the amplifiers. It's an op amp. It takes quiet signals and makes them loud. This is one of those situations where, frankly, I need to focus. Let's flow some solder on. Okay, that feels reattached. Ooh, that one doesn't look good. All right, let's see what it does. All right, hit it. Program. Program on. Well, I have signal from both channels again. Now, where did I put my inefficient readjustment tool? That's the that's the big one. All right, crisis averted. So after Sam said crisis averted, what actually then ended up happening was Sam sitting down into a chair, like with his entire body and him staring off at a fixed point in the distance, sweating and nearly crying. And I asked him if he was okay and he said no. And he revealed that that one little op amp that had fallen off that he had to resolder, um, basically could have just blown up the entire board. Like might as well have impaled it, put it under a steamroller dropped it in the Salish Sea. Uh, yeah. So at that point, I got a little nervous too. But it was all post-nervousness. Board worked. Sam is an expert solderer. It went awesome. All right, let's start the tour of the studio with the underside of it. These are the, this is the power and digital rack. This is the beep boop side and some of the power stuff. So over here, uh, you can see most of this is blocked off. This used to be a bunch of rack mod equipment, but it was equipment that people weren't really gonna need to access on a regular basis. And in fact, I didn't want them to access it on a regular basis. So that got all put in and then covered up. The only thing that is user accessible on this side is this panel here. 
So these two uh, inputs here, aux and aux here, those go to the same place. Uh, those go to the aux input on the board and on the uh, and on the digital mixer. So if somebody is like doing live music in here or something like that and they want their own equipment uh, plugged in, this is, uh, this is where they can plug it in. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of testing on it, but uh, there it is. This is the main output of the XR18 mixer. Um, it's there for testing purposes, as is the outputs of the XR18 headphones here. Uh, they're, they're just for, for debugging and testing. There's no reason anybody other than me is going to need to look at it. In fact, this is going to be such a confusing mess coming out of these because of all the things that are connected to it. It has no purpose other than debugging. Um, we have more blank panels here. This is the power supply that caused me so much trouble that one time. This is just a pair of cooling fans in case we need them. Uh, they're just 12 volt DC fans in there and they just give a little bit of cooling. And then up here is the amplifier. It's a Crown D75 and it powers our, uh, our monitors. And uh, I mean, we could turn it on and off and, and adjust the volume, but there's really no point in it. So here we are up on the desk. Uh, this is the input rack. All of the inputs come in here. And here's really only what's visible. This is kind of iceberg city. There's a lot going on inside, not a lot going on here. Uh, this is the tuner. That is our air check. This is how we know, how we can test what we're actually transmitting is we listen to it. And here's a tuner tuned to 95.3. And then these four things are our microphone processors. I have three Symmetrix 528s and, it, and one of its direct replacement, the 528E. Um, these are things that I, that I hope to set and forget. I don't want people to be touching them, but they are rack mount equipment. This is the best place to put them. At some point, I may make a cover that goes over this and covers these up when uh, they're not being adjusted. Now let's look at things that people are actually supposed to touch. This is the this is right in front of the input rack, and here are three input devices. Um, for phones. We've got this simple Cisco uh, IP phone that came from, uh, came from a friend. Uh, for a while I was thinking I was gonna have to like do a SIP phone or a SIP system or a computer and it was gonna be a lot of work. And then I got these phones and I noticed that they had headsets on the side. So why not do that? Um, you know, really straightforward. So people can make their phone calls yeah, we can dial in uh, our on hold music. And you're and we're listening to uh, we're listening to what KTQA is transmitting, uh, which is what we're using for our on hold music. This you've probably seen enough of, and then this, which we haven't talked a lot about, but a lot of work has gone into it. I'll bring you in a little bit closer to take a look at it. But this is a, uh, I think a JC Penny uh, turntable that was actually made by Technix, I think. Uh, but it's direct drive. The needle is replaceable with uh, uh, decent needles. It was really easy to adjust the pitch and speed, and eh, it works pretty well. It, it works well enough to start with. Um, you know, at some point we'll probably get real DJ turntables, but this is good to get us started. You know, start simple and then iterate. And then here's the board. Uh, at some point I'll do a video of how to operate the board, but it has a timer, has a clock, haven't set the clock. Um, you know, the everything, all, all the blinky lights work and we have console, which is the console operator microphone here and then guest one two and three were the microphones you've seen over there and then phone which is the phone you just saw voip is a computer that is up here uh that is up here there's nothing much special about it here i'll show it to you uh there it is it's just a uh, a computer with a webcam and a web browser 
so that people who are connecting via Skype or Zoom or Jitsi, which is what we use, uh, can all, you know, can participate and then be mixed in. Uh, then we got CPU one, which is this computer here and specifically this cart player, which is just a digital audio file player that, uh, uh, uses MPV for a backend and an interface that I wrote. Um, it also has the controls on it. These meters here are, are actually coming from the transmitter site. Uh, our automation system runs at the transmitter site. This is the VU for the transmitter. This is what's actually being transmitted. Uh, sorry, this is the VU for the automation. This is what's being transmitted. And if I turn on, if I turn my microphone on, you can see that uh, you can see what I'm doing. There is a little bit of a delay because this is going to the transmitter site and then this meter is coming from there. And then these buttons here can control whether or not we're on automation or on studio. And this is a touch screen. Uh, this one's not, this is a touch screen. Um, and then down here are buttons that control recording. This button here captures the output of the R60. Uh, and that captures as a two channel flack. This button here captures 18 tracks in a WAV file, and it's literally every device. So that if you want to do all your mixing in post, you can. I don't know that it's the smartest move I've ever made, but it is a move that I have made. Uh, and then up here, you know, they got the monitors that, that you expect. There's the bunny ears that we talked about earlier. Uh, there's the wireless keyboard for controlling the VoIP computer. Well, you've seen the blinking lights. You've been on the tour. Would you like to see the first thing that was produced in this studio? I'm sure you would. Here it is. All right. Um, mix. This is the KTQA Weekly COVID Update. Your quick source for locations on COVID-19 vaccination and testing locations. All adults 18 and older can get any vaccine. And as of May 12th, adolescents aged 12 to 17 can get Pfizer shots when accompanied by a parent or guardian. Additionally, the following locations offer vaccines on an ongoing basis with no appointment needed. Lakewood Town Center, 7 days a week, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Hilltop Family Medical Center. For free rides to your vaccine appointment, call Pierce Transit at 253-581-8000 or Around the Sound at 253-858-7088. If you call 1-833-VAX-HELP, you can also go to scanpublichealth.org to request a free home test kit with a 48-hour turnaround time. So this concludes the first phase of Waveform Orchard, the YouTube channel, the studio build-out. And I did it, and I met my deadline. And at this point, you do know that uh, the deadline was I wanted this studio operable before I went in for brain surgery. And just under the wire, brain surgery happens in two days' time. <laughs> we still have a long ways to go. We haven't done sound treatment in here yet. You might be able to hear a little bit of echo in this because of that. Um... But everything functions. Work can be done in this space. And as you saw, work was done in this space. So now I can take some time, rest up, and get ready for the next phase. And I'll see you then.